As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he said, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means send. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that, that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and washed. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Awesome. Thanks, Jill. Can we say thank you to Jill? Be great. Awesome. So I don't know if you're anything like me, but I grew up in a house where blame kind of was free-flowing in some different kinds of ways. So example... A, somebody uses the bathroom and forgets to flush, and we need to figure out who the last one was in there, all right? Or toilet paper. You use, go in, you use the bathroom. I promise it's, they're not all bathroom examples, just the first two. And you use the bathroom, and, you know, there's like a little bit of paper left, and you're like, oh, the next person will probably get it, right? And then that next person comes in, and they want to know who was the last person that used the bathroom because you need to change the toilet paper. Or if you've like been in a workplace and somebody brings spaghetti for lunch, right, and they put it in the microwave and you know what happens. It just gets everywhere no matter what you do and they want to know like, hey, who used the microwave last? Or you're in your home and one person's, you know, up kind of late or whatever and the lights get left on or the doors, I mean, these are endless right? Somebody makes a sandwich. And some of you live with people who do not spin the deal and they tie it back up. You just sort of like stuff it back into the corner or a bread box. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but I just know that that's just a part of life. But blame is also a part of life. And, and, and why is it so easy for blame to spread from person to person? Why, why, why do we want to figure out, like, hey, who was the last one to make a turkey sandwich? Like, who drank this milk and put just, like, one swallow back into the refrigerator? You have those people in your world? Like, why is it? There's something in us. There is this justice that we want to be enacted. And we sort of see that in this story today of Jesus and the disciples. Like they're interested, like they want to understand, like how did this happen? And it's interesting that the Bible actually doesn't spend a lot of time talking to us about blame. The Bible doesn't actually talk to us a lot about whose fault things are. What does the Bible talk to us about, Dave? The Bible talks to us about who the Savior is. Over and over and over and over. We have seen that in the book of John. That John wants to say as loud as he can. John wants to talk with his hands to say Jesus is the Savior. I mean, for crying out loud, he gets washed in a pool of Salome that was name was sent. And this is John's way of saying Jesus is the one who has been sent into the world to save. And so a couple of things happen. Verse one and two, kind of the first section. I love this. Jesus, as he went along, 
he what? He saw. He's just like going about like his life, his routine as he goes along and he sees. And I just think how easy for, is it for us to go along and to miss? Like to go along our daily routine, whatever we have going on, and it's just easy for us to not have our eye on people, but have our eyes turned inward. To have an eye on a list, to have an eye on a goal. And one of the things that life with God does, one of the things that walking with Jesus will do over time is our eyes will be turned not inwardly, but our eyes will begin to be turned outwardly. And he's a man who was blind from birth, we find out. So this is a man who's never even seen his own face. He's never seen the faces of his family members. He's never seen a sunrise, never seen a sunset. Like, he's been blind from birth. And because he's been blind from birth, he didn't have access to the resources that people who could see could. And so he's not only blind, but he has to beg for money to even eat. And so that lets us know that at some point there was some kind of brokenness within his family because this man's family did not take care of him. Where we'll meet his parents later in the book of John and for some reason, there's some kind of brokenness there. And so this man is known as the guy who couldn't see and the guy who would beg. And the disciples, you know, say, like, why is this man suffering? Like, whose fault is this? Like, who sinned? It's either that he sinned or his parents sinned. Like, tell us, who didn't clean the microwave after the Easy Mac? I want to know. It's important to me. And the disciples are doing something. What are the disciples doing? The disciples are connecting present pain with past sin. And we do the same thing. We're connecting the, the pain that they are experiencing with something that has happened, something that somebody has done in the past. Because I think we really struggle if we don't understand things. I think we will, we will take great measures to understand and to even say we understand when we don't. This is the story of Job, right? Job's this guy in the Old Testament and he loses it all. And that's not proverbial. He actually loses everything. Loses his income, loses his family, loses his place in society. He's not really left with anything at all, but he's got a couple friends. And his couple friends are, I think, mostly trying to be helpful. They're trying to help him process all of this loss. And, you know, friends aren't perfect. They say things that don't make any sense. And so they tell him, hey, like, you must have done something wrong. Like, God must be angry with you. So, like, think back. Like, hey, what, what was last Tuesday like? Anything you can think of? Anything stand out? And they kind of go through this roll of the decks. And, and Job is, is blameless. He's faithful in the, in the eyes of God. So the disciples have this question, like, who sinned, either him or his parents? And following the question, there's an assumption, Right? So why is he suffering? The assumption is somebody did something wrong. And the assumption that follows the question is then followed by some conclusion about God. Like God must be a punishing God. Like so there's this question and then this assumption and then conclusion. And I think this happens to us, right? Like, like we pray about something. Something that's like really, really important. I wish you could hear all of the prayers that I led teenagers through. Like middle school kids, hey, I want to pray for this. I want to pray for that. Amazing, amazing things. Like, would you pray for my grandma's hamster? She's not feeling very well. You bet. So we pray about something. And the reason I don't ridicule those prayers is because those are real things. 
And so no matter what age you are, the, the thing that is in your heart that you desire to see God move and do something, like that matters to God. But we have all things that we will pray about. And then it's like, well, like God doesn't answer it. It doesn't seem to answer it the way that we want him to. So our assumption is God's either in, uninterested or he's unmoved. But that leads to the conclusion that we make about God. Like, well, he must not care then. And I just have to tell you today that suffering in the scriptures is never one thing. So it's never one thing. I don't know if there's any like soup people in here, any stew people in here, any like chili people in here. I will tell you that I married into a family of soup. Like soup is a staple in our house. Makes sense. My last name's Campbell, right? Isn't I? <laughs> I happen, I've been working on that one all week. I was just waiting for just the right time to drop it, and that was it. But I didn't know that when Michaela and I got married. Like I, that wasn't part of like the dating process, like me asking her about soup and all that. We do a lot of soup in our house. And what's amazing about soup, what's great about soup, it's not just like a single ingredient that makes it great. It's all of the things together you're making a stew or a chili it's all of the things together you don't just single out this or that or this other thing but it's everything together and when we talk about suffering in the scriptures it's never just like who messed up like who sinned like who made God mad who didn't pray enough who wasn't good enough who wasn't faithful enough who didn't do it right we talk about suffering in the scriptures, we can talk about, number one, Genesis chapter four. Suffering in the scriptures, broken people are expressing their power to choose. Why is suffering happen? Why is the man blind? Genesis chapter four, broken people are exercising their power to choose. So it's a story of these two brothers. And one brother doesn't just fight the other brother. One brother doesn't just tease the brother. One brother kills the other brother, Genesis 4. It's an expression of their power to choose. Number two, we can talk about the corrupting power of sin within systems. So Romans chapter 8, Paul will talk about the corrupting power of sin, not just with people, but in systems. So he'll talk about powers and principalities. And so you'll bump into some people and they'll say, they hurt me. Bump into some people, like if you do what I do for a living, you hear a lot of people who will talk about how the church has hurt them. And they're not just talking about one person, but the, the, the collective, the community, has hurt them. There's a wound that they carry. And so they're not actually that interested in walking through doors like this. It's the corrupting power of sin within systems. Uh, number three, this is James chapter one, that God's producing character. Why is there suffering? Because there's something that God wants to produce within us. Like there's something that needs to exit our life and our heart and our soul so that something else can enter. And so you're going to walk through days, you're going to experience pain, you're going to carry wounds, and part of what God is doing is he's producing some character within you. And then we can talk about discipline, Hebrews chapter 12. The writer of Hebrews, it's this sermon, it's a 12-chapter sermon, and the, the writer, the pastor, the speaker is talking about that God only disciplines those he loves. And for some of us, we're like, that sounds familiar. I feel like I got a speech like that when I was 13. Like, this is going to hurt me a whole lot, Right? It's going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, right? And he's, it's part of what it means to be a child of God is that we are going to walk through discipline. And number five, Galatians chapter five, suffering in the scriptures is a consequence of our own choices. So again, Paul will write to a New Testament church and say, you know what? Like, you're going to reap what you sow. 
it turns out like you don't actually get to never put any money into a bank account and then pull out a million dollars when you're 65. Like you're actually going to reap what you have sown. Like you didn't sow anything. There's nothing that's going to come from it. And he's going to say, God's not going to be mocked. He's not going to allow that to happen. He's not going to be okay with that. So suffering sometimes is a consequence of my own choices. The thing that I chose. And number six, this is Paul again in Philippians chapter one. We suffer because it's a witness to the power of the gospel. And so Paul will be in prison in Rome when he's writing this letter. And he's saying that his chains have produced something, like his chains have purpose. Because what has happened is the whole palace guard, all of these soldiers who were holding him captive, something's happened to them. Like they've seen the power of God because how could you be under this sentence and have joy? Like, how could you sit in a jail cell and talk to them about this God who is good and faithful and present and loving and gracious? And so the suffering is like this wildfire that spreads throughout all of the palace guard. And so all these Roman soldiers like, are coming to know Jesus because they got to see Paul's chains. And so it's a witness to the power of of the gospel. And then number seven, and just so you know, there's a ton of these. These are just the ones, I chose the ones that I think come up the most. Job chapter one, suffering because there's a cosmic battle between good and evil. You know, like why do we, so many of us enjoy movies, stories? Because there's a battle. Like, if there's no battle Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman has to fight, like, what's the point in that? And this is going back to Job, that there's a battle being waged in heaven and on earth against good and evil. Remember, there's a good shepherd and there's a hired hand. And they've got different ideas about how the world should work. And so suffering's more of a stew. It's never just one thing. It's several things working together. Verse chapter 3, Jesus says it's not his fault. It's not his parents' fault either. It's really interesting. I was thinking about Genesis chapter 1 this week, and what I think is interesting about Genesis chapter 1 is that God doesn't really describe the chaos in like great detail there's a couple words that he uses to describe the chaos it says that the earth was empty and it was formless and that darkness was over it all empty formless and that darkness was over it all he he doesn't say whose fault the chaos is he doesn't say whose fault the darkness is he doesn't spend time talking about that. But what does he do? He brings light in the darkness. He doesn't say who messed up or is it this person or this person or this person or this scenario. No, he just brings light. And after speaking light into existence, a whole new world. Out of the formless and empty and dark World, And I just think in this moment, as we step into Holy Week, there's a, there's a chaos that was at the very beginning and there's a chaos that is coming this week, that there is a, a darkness that is going to fall this week. There's a formlessness and there's going to be an emptiness that is going to come this week. Genesis 1 happens again on Holy Week. And I'll tell you, I've never thought about that before until this week. And it's just why I love the Bible. Because the more you read it, the more you're into it, the more you see. 
It's Genesis chapter 1 again. I mean, ask the disciples how they felt when their Savior gets nailed to a cross. And they think Rome, like think about being hunted by a government. They think that they are being going to be hunted by Rome. Formless, empty, and dark. But with the resurrection, what? There is a light that comes into the world, but then there, there's a whole new world that is being created. And then verses 6 and 7, there's a shift. Jesus turns the conversation. So we were talking about like, hey, whose fault was it? Was it this person? Was it this person? But Jesus turns the conversation. He turns the man from being a case study for theological debate to being an object of God's mercy. Like he, he's not a case study. Like he's a person. Like we're not going to like dehumanize him. We're not going to rip him from his humanity. We're not going to shame him any more than he's already experienced. And Jesus turns the conversation from a theological debate about this man's suffering to helping everybody understand that he's an object of God's mercy. And I just believe this, church. I don't know if we will ever be more like Jesus than when we are willing to turn conversations. I think that's a moment for you and I to be like Jesus. Like when we're in a conversation in our home, and it's like, who's going to turn this thing? Like when we're in a conversation with a, a coworker about somebody else who happens to get employed at that address. And there's a turn in the conversation. Oh, hey, actually, no, like I'm not going to like talk that way about that person. There's a turn in the conversation. I think that's the way we will be like God. I think that's the way we will follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And I think if the people of God would do that more, I actually believe there would be people who would follow us there. But what I think happens instead is the people of God sometimes aren't actually that interested in turning the conversation. And that smacked me in the face this week as I read this. Oh, that we could be some be turners of conversations in our world. Whether it's online or whether it's in person. Because I believe there's a lot of conversations that are happening that grieve the heart of God deeply. I actually believe that this moment in John chapter 9 grieves the heart of God deeply. And I just bumped the projector. Get it together. Could we be those kinds of people? Could we do that? I think it's the way that we will be most like our Savior. This is not just talking to someone about someone. This is talking to God about someone. It's not talking to someone about someone. It's talking to God about someone. And honestly, some of us need to work on that. Some of us need to take a step towards that. So let's talk about Jesus' saliva. I believe uh, that John is waving his hands to get our attention to go all the way back to the Genesis account. In the ancient world, saliva was viewed as having magical powers, believe it or not. And so the rabbis really discouraged you from spreading it around. And Jesus, I think, does this in two ways. One is a nod to the Pharisees to be like, hey, watch this. But then he also knows about the Genesis account. And so he, again, takes some dirt and he adds some spit to it and puts it on the man's 
eyes. I think that this is two things. I think this is an act of mercy. I think of all of the people who have walked by this man, some people putting a coin in, but so many people walking by, and the man can't ever see them walking by. He's blind, but he can hear them walking by. And in this moment, this is an act of mercy, but it is more than that. It is also an act of creation. That Jesus is speaking into the formless and empty and dark world of this man and he's bringing light and he's bringing a whole new world a whole new way of living a whole new way of seeing in the ancient world like there were just things that you didn't do like there were like social norms like you didn't touch a dead person's body and Jesus does in Luke chapter 7 There's a young man who has died, and there's a funeral, and Jesus interrupts the funeral. And he raises this little boy to life. Happens in this town called Nain, one of my favorite stories in all the scriptures. You didn't touch a leper, uh, this horrible, painful skin disease that isolated you from community. But he does that in Matthew chapter 8. You didn't eat with tax collectors. But he does in Luke chapter 19. There's this guy named Zacchaeus. He wasn't just a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector. So he's a big deal. He's the boss of the boss of the tax collector. So like he and Rome are in it together. And he says, hey, like come down from that tree. Like we're going to hang out. And his life has changed. Now you didn't If you were a Jew, you did not talk to a woman from Samaria, and you definitely didn't do it alone. And he does this in John chapter 4. You didn't let a woman anoint you with her hair. And he does in Matthew 26. Another thing I just have to tell you that I noticed this week for the first time ever is that anointing happens And then the arrest and then the torture of Jesus happens. And you talk about the the sacrifice of Jesus. And I think it's very possible, it's very likely that that, that there is the uh, sweet aroma that is emitting from his body during that time. Because he's been anointed. So even in the dark, in the evil, in the violent, there's also something else at play. And then, I mean, you also didn't die on a Roman cross willingly. And we see that in Luke chapter 23, when Jesus gives his life. He doesn't fight it. And he gives his life. And so here is Jesus, like unprotected humanity, in undiminished divinity. So he's fully God, fully man. He doesn't hold back any of his humanity. And none of his divinity is sacrificed. And the the chaos and the misery of of this present world are taken into the hands of Jesus. And those are the materials that he is going to create this whole new world. Like He doesn't say goodbye to this world that he's created. He doesn't send it off into sea. He doesn't destroy it. Like he's promised in the account of Noah that like he's never going to destroy again. He takes the pain and the misery in his hands and those become the materials with which he is building his new world. He's speaking into the formlessness and the emptiness of the world and bringing his light. And I just think that is an amazing thing to think about on Palm Sunday. Because what happens on Palm Sunday? Like there's a crowd. And how many of you know that anytime you see a crowd, you can see wounds? You can see pain. You can see anguish. You can see heartache. And so the, line, the streets of Jerusalem are, are lined with people. And they've spread their coats out. 
And Jesus is seated on this donkey that he got (laughs) from this random person. Told the disciples, like, hey, go get me a donkey. And they go to a random dude's house, and they get this donkey. God's prepared this whole thing. And he's seated on this donkey. It's not like a war horse that the Romans would have ridden on. The only picture that I can paint to help you understand it, it's like if I started like riding a bicycle for a two-year-old. It would just be ridiculous. Like you would not do that. It looks silly. Because it's not a, not a picture of strength. Like nobody's running from, well, everybody's running from me if they see me doing that, but for different reasons. Not because they're scared, but because they're freaked out. And Jesus enters into Jerusalem, and he can hear, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. But do you know what he can also see? Blindness. It's not just this man who had been lying there day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, who was blind. Jesus is seeing a whole people, an entire generation of Jewish people who are there to celebrate the Passover. They're there to celebrate the fact that God has led them out of Egypt and into the land of promise by crossing a body of water. They're there to celebrate that, but they're blind. And so I think as he looks at the crowds, he can see all kinds of things. All kinds of scars, all kinds of wounds, all kinds of fear, all kinds of blindness. And what I think Jesus knows in that moment and what he makes apparent in this story is that to every wound, to every brokenness, to every battle, there's enough dirt and saliva to go around for everybody. And that is what is going to send him to the cross. Like Rome doesn't send him. He willingly goes. Willingly goes. Because he didn't just come to repair and to restore the he- and heal the, the blindness of this man. He came to heal my blindness and your blindness. Not just the wounds that I carry, but the wounds that you carry. Not just the doubts that fill my own heart, but the doubts that fill your own heart. The ways that I, I'm tempted to, to be in control of my own life and my own story. And find my identity and what I have and what I do and what other people think about me. And Jesus is like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, you're you're not seeing. And so he stoops down and he spits in his hands. I'm not going to do it. And puts it on my eyes. I've come that you would see. And so when we celebrate Palm Sunday... Sometimes the way we talk about this in the church is it's just like this like pep rally for Jesus. And I think it's actually a moment where we see just how blind we can be because we can say with our mouth, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. But with our eyes, what we see are the ways in which we are king. So he's going to go to the cross this week for all of that. He's going to have a last meal with his disciples. And he's going to wash their feet. He's going to say, hey, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And they're like, we want to go. And he'll say, well, just cool it. You are going to but if I've promised you that I'm going to prepare a place for you, will you trust the fact that what I'm saying to you is true? And he gets arrested. And then he spends several hours in isolation and being tortured and being 
put on a cross and being mocked and ridiculed and made fun of. But the entire time, there's enough dirt and saliva for everybody. So even the Roman soldier, the Roman centurion who will say with his own lips, surely this man was the son of God. You want to talk about blind becoming sight. And then he's raised to life. And these two women are the first ones who know. And if you're asking it's on purpose, yes, it's on purpose. Because he's turning the whole thing upside down. Because it's not an old world, it's a new world. It's a world where gender doesn't give you a voice, the spirit gives you a voice. That's a sermon for another day that you're not going to get right now, even though I'm tempted to give it. And then he says, like, go tell everybody. Go tell, go tell the disciples and Peter. And they have breakfast at this, I think, probably amazing spot. See a Galilee. The same place where he walked towards them, where he approached them on the water. And then four days later, he ascends into heaven. And we're still faced with the choice to believe that there's enough mud and saliva to go around. You know, the blind man had a choice. He didn't need to go and wash in the pool. He didn't need to walk in what had been spoken over him. But he does. And so I just wonder today, like, what the step is that God's asking of you. Not just to sit and listen, but to walk in what he's spoken. And anytime we will walk in what he has spoken, I believe that God will be kind enough to allow us to see things for how they really are. It doesn't take away the, the pain and the brokenness of our own story. I don't think that magically once this man could see that all those family relationships, that was all healed. Like you imagine like knowing you've been ridiculed your entire life and now you actually get to look at the people in the eye who have ridiculed you. So suffering's not one thing. It's a stew. But no matter what the suffering is, no matter what the pain is, no matter what the blindness is, there's light being spoken into the formless and dark and empty world. And there's a new world that is to come. We pray, God, thank you so much for these people and for the blessing of opening the scriptures with them today. God, we speak against the, the blinding that has happened in our world and in us, and we pray for the sight that we need to live according to your word and your promises and your goodness today. God, we pray this week that we wouldn't hurry past the suffering, we wouldn't hurry past the pain, we wouldn't hurry past the wounds so we could get to resurrection, but that we would sit in the dark and the formlessness of the world. And that would ready us to celebrate to the resurrection that comes from your hand. Pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing one more song together.